Okay, everyone, uh, thanks for coming. Um, today, we're joined by uh, the, the writer and journalist Eche Tamelkaran. Uh, she's written for The Guardian, The New Left Review, The New York Times, and The Berliner Zeitung. Uh, and she's won many awards for her work, including the Pen for Peace Award and Turkish Journalist of the Year. Uh, she's the author of the best-selling book, How to Lose a Country, The Seven Steps from Democracy to Dictatorship, which we'll, we'll talk about today. Uh, so a bit of housekeeping, how this is going to work. Um, I'll pose questions for around 30 to 40 minutes, uh, and then we'll throw it over to uh, the participants, um, which you, you can put your questions in the Q&A function below, and we'll get around to them um, throughout the session. So for those who don't know who you are, I'll give you an introduction there, but um, can you give us an outline of the work you've been involved in um, and why you're interested in the things you're writing about? Uh, you mean how to lose a country or in general? Yeah. How to lose a country. Okay. Um, for those who have already read the book, they would know that actually uh, I, started, I decided to write the book after 2016 uh, when the coup attempt happened in Turkey uh, during July the 15th, 2016. Um, after that, the country has become obviously dangerous uh, place for people like me. So I decided to come to Zagreb, uh, where I'm living now. And then meanwhile, of course, it was impossible not to see that same things, similar things were happening in Western democracies as well. Uh, and I made it my mission, <laughs> sort of, to warn the Western democracies, including the United States, uh, about the coming uh, monster, uh, political monster, a moral monster. So that's why I wrote How to Lose a Country. And I, uh, you know, witnessed that there was a repeating pattern a um, mechanism that's worked, that worked exactly the same way in each democracy, regardless of the fact that these countries are completely different from each other and the maturity of democracy is uh, better or, or, you know, they had more established democracies in Western countries, but that didn't make a difference at the end. Uh, that's why you now have Boris Johnson and United States is trying to get rid of Trump with all its institutions. Um, so yeah, uh, and, I, and I try to show the main mechanism behind right-wing populism or authoritarianism and how it creeps to the system so that people in the Western democracies can stop uh, this course of events before it's too late for them, uh, which didn't really work out so far. Um, but I think now there's a better, um, a wider acknowledgement of the situation because when I first wrote the book, um, there was this Western exceptionalism, both in the United States and Britain, in other countries as well, Netherlands or you know several other countries, uh, and now they too they too know that it is not about being Christian because that was also an argument that was brought up. Uh, several times during the book events. Being Christian, uh, having better democracies, having uh, more you know, established institutions and so on and so forth. These do not uh, stop the global rise of right-wing populism. So um, yeah, this is what I tried to do. And after I wrote the book, um, it has been published in several languages. Um, and it has been read throughout the book so far, uh, throughout the world so far. And it is amazing to see that a guy from Chile is talking to a guy in India about how to lose a country and uh, seeing the similarities uh, of their troubles. And that was the main idea of the book because I wanted to show the pattern, the main logic, the main mechanism of right wing populism in order to create a global conversation. Um, and then hopefully a global resistance um, against these leaders. So I think it's 
sort of happening and uh, I, you know I want to believe that how to lose a country has a little bit of part in it. You mentioned the, the, the coup just then of July 2016. Mm -hmm. uh, how significant was that for Erdogan and authoritarian populism generally? Well, uh, many people, even the you know, well-established analysts, thought that it was a manufactured staged coup and so on. It wasn't, uh, as far as I understand it. But um, these authoritarian leaders, and that goes for all of them, have the habit of turning these crises into their uh, into benefits. And our authoritarian leader is the best of them. You know, he can, he's as good as Putin when it comes to being the political animal. Um, in that sense, Trump, you know, Americans are quite lucky. Trump is not a politician and he doesn't know about politics, but you know, Mr. Erdogan is a political wizard and he used this uh, biggest crisis of Turkish democracy uh, to turn it into the biggest um, advantage uh, for his, um, you know, desire of more power. And at the end, um, under the, uh, you know, he used this as an excuse to purge uh, all the um, opposition in Turkey. And uh, he, and we can we can call that a political vendetta uh, that started after uh, the July coup in 2016. Only in two years, uh, 4,000 judges were, um, you know, sacked, and I don't know how many academics, journalists, um, officers, and so on. Every you know, all those who were not complying with the regime uh, were kind of dismantled completely. So this is what the coup, how the coup benefited him. It wasn't a stage coup, but even if it was a stage coup, it couldn't have been better for him the, as, as, you know, as of the outcome of the coup. So with the rise of right-wing populism across Europe and across the world, um, to what extent um, are the causes in each of those countries linked? Is it a dissatisfaction with globalization? Is it the spread of misinformation? Is it the consequences of the financial crash? Oh, there are so many reasons, and I try to you know, explain them, almost all of it, in the book. Um, Definitely, 2008 financial crisis has, especially for the Western countries, it has a lot of impact. It had a lot of impact and it, it has created a lot of anger that then was organized and mobilized by, by these leaders. But overall, uh, and I think this is the main argument that would separate my, separate my book from the other books that are about authoritarianism, is that I do think that uh, what we are going through uh, on global level is the outcome, is the result of 1980s. I think we are, um, you know, going through the consequences of 1980s uh, where neoliberalism was unleashed and the human was reshaped again and I think we are unfortunately suffering from the consequences of that morality of that of that economic system and of that political system as well democracies are now a theatrics nothing more than a theatrics and we all know that ballot box you know they are all diminished to ballot boxes ironically we are seeing in the united states um, so equal representation uh, did not uh, fulfill its promise thanks to the capitalist idea, uh, capitalist system because nobody is equal and promising them e equality is just a false promise and people have been t uh, disappointed for too many times and I think the main anger comes from that and also 
Uh, I argue that uh, this is, you know, 19th century representative democracy um, rules do not apply uh, to this century's needs and technological improvement. It is, uh, the, I mean, like, I, I do think that it is quite, you know, ridiculous, almost nonsensical uh, to do everything from your iPhone, but, uh, you know, to exist on digital universe, but then this democracy, the, the entire establishment of democracy cannot still um, adapt itself uh, to this new uh, communication sphere. And also there is the fact that the communication sphere is uh, dramatically reshaped. And as we remember, once the radio became a mass communication tool, uh, it brought with itself fascism. Um, and now we have social media and it's bringing us these um, right-wing populist leaders, authoritarianism, or new type of fascism, let's say, because it is irregular, I mean, it's not regular yet, and there is no democracy on the planet that is powerful enough to regulate the social media. So once your communication sphere is you know, unregulated, the truth becomes a commodity that goes to the highest bidder. So I think this is one of the reasons as well. Uh, but at the heart of it, as I said, uh, a system is crumbling um, and the new system is not born yet. <laughs> we are suffering the morbid symptoms, as Gramsci would say. I think one of the, the most interesting uh, parts of the book is when you say that wherever populism manifests itself, um, that the leaders always get caricatured and we sort of treat them like infants, don't we? So uh, mm -hmm. in the New York Times, um, you know, Steve Bannon and Trump would be presented as children. And it's quite easy to do at the moment because, yeah. you know, Trump looks like, you know, a child who's lost a game of Monopoly at the moment. Um, so how, how dangerous is that, do you think, that we underestimate these people? I just wrote a piece for Guardian about uh, American elections and how it should be perceived. I mean, Trump's refusal to uh, smooth transition. And they are still doing the same mistake, I think, American um, media and several people in, uh, co several commentators. They are psycho psychologizing the issue, whereas this matter is, uh, you know, strictly political. Uh, and they try to attribute uh, this crisis to Trump's personal allergy to loss, his, you know, temperament and so on. It's not like that. And you know, these people are not as stupid or as clownish as they might look like. Um, so meanwhile, while people are, you know, diagnosing, diagno diagnosing him psychologically, he's actually building a shadow state uh, within the state by appointing uh, new people to the critical positions in the state apparatus. But once you start calling these guys infantile, or once you start, you know, mm, psychoanalyzing them in absentia, uh, which we were doing uh, for Erdogan as well, and once you start uh, calling them, oh, broken, broken children, we have to heal them, uh, it becomes a domestic, uh, it becomes a um, benign issue as if. And it is a certain perspective on politics uh, that goes, uh, that again, goes back to 1980s. Since people do not want to talk about politics and since people uh, forgot to think politically, they are, you know, retreating to the realm of psychology, realm of emotions, realm of how we feel about this, how, what's our perception and so on, or the symbolism of it. This is a political matter, it's about power. And these guys uh, are, you know, grabbing power and they are reshaping the history of the world. But not only that, they are reshaping the global morality, not only politics, but all, also global morality. They are defining what is good and what is bad, what is beautiful, what is ugly. 
you know, they are, uh, what they are doing at the moment, all these authoritarian leaders, is infusing uh, to the deepest level uh, of humankind, human, human mind. So uh, it is, it, you know, it is like do domesticating uh, the issue by saying that, oh, you know, they are the, you know, we are the adults in the room and they are the children, so we have to treat them as children. No, they're not the children. They are big men and they actually are enjoying being the strong big men in the room. And on the U.S. election, um, we've obviously seen Trump's uh, refusal to ac accept the result. Um, how damaging is that for democracy generally, do you think? Well, it is. Um, I don't know if they see themselves from outside. Uh, you know, I mean, like we know Americans more than they know us. This is the way of the world. Uh, the entire world have been studying what electoral vote means, what, you know, they were trying to understand what, you know, electoral college means. They, you know, we all now know the counties of Georgia and their political structure and so on. Um, I'm like the rest of the world. And for those of us who know about illiberal democracy, whatever that is, um, um, the, the tragedy is the entire, uh, you know, political institution, well, in, entire political establishment, uh, entire state's establishment uh, are coming together just to make this guy go away, get out of the White House. So there is nothing victorious about this. So this guy, you know, Trump, when Trump came to power, uh, the book was just out and I was in the United States uh, doing book events, talking to people, and, you know, warning them. It was, uh, they were so sleepwalking into it because I remember many people from New York, from other newspapers as well, commentators, uh, being very sure that he wouldn't even um, in the White House for one year and four years not after after you know during the fourth year they were talking about uh, would it be that he 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 you know wins the second term so um, I don't think they are aware of the fact that how much normalized uh, during the last four years uh, four years ago Trump was an impossible for American people, and now we are a possible coup. Well, actually, if you ask me, there's a coup happening already, but you know, nobody wants to, not, not many people wants to pronounce it because I understand it, it's, you know, damages their dignity, their national dignity or whatever. But uh, I think this is what a uh, new, new form of fascism does to us. It doesn't come uh, fully formed with goose steps, you know, in uniforms and sulking faces and so on. It comes with this confusion, this maddening, uh, uh, maddening, maddening, um, you know, uh, uh, utilization of crisis, uh, the, the, the constant uh, mode crisis and and it's this exhausting um, over politicization of uh, the social sphere and keeping people on their toes until they are so exhausted they that they lose interest in politics altogether so it is this vagueness uh, that they create uh, is the problem and this Wagness, this confusion, uh, this exhausting, you know, uh, exhausting period is exhausting um, uh, politics of crisis, let's say, uh, is the tool of a uh, new form of fascism. And it is so easy to normalize this because it's also invigorating. It's also, you know, you are politically mobilized as well as we also in the United States, in Britain and in other countries. So, and the polarization, of course, uh, becomes so deep 
uh, that it becomes impossible to get rid of it, even though you get rid of the reader, leader. So, uh, and all these things are normalized. And I don't know if Americans are aware of this. That's why I think democracy, American democracy, which was already damaged and, you know, have a lot of problems, uh, is now uh, facing its biggest crisis since the Civil War. Yeah, so you, t you touched on it there, and chapter one's called um, Create a Movement. So Trump's going to go in January, but do you think Trump is, Trumpism as a movement, do you think that's going to endure? Well, this is the thing. We shouldn't um, expect a clear move from Trump. It will be like this constant ambi ambivalence, let's say. But it was very interesting uh, when Trump first appeared on, in the White House during the election night. Um, he didn't say it, but Mike Pence say, said it, which was even more dangerous to me. He said, our movement, and that was the first time that word was pronounced since a few years now. So, this our movement thing is not not good at all because we know that within the state apartheid they are uh, with these app new appointments they are uh, you know forming black op uh, team of politics so to speak and meanwhile as we saw the proud boys today yesterday or today this morning i don't know uh, in what yesterday in washington uh, they are walking around and shooting and so on this is um, ISIS. This is uh, this is um, tension. And even if Biden manages to himself in the White House, sit in the office, I think it will be there. This you know, const like a mosquito, uh, constantly. So, uh, but one has to know that this is not only because Trump does not want to lose. Um, it is, uh, and one of the reasons I wrote the book, these uh, new fascist leaders are collaborating uh, on global level. Uh, it's not because they love each other. It is because they are also representing the global web of dirty money or capital, the new capital, let's say. So actually, they do not have chance to lose. And even if they lose, they have to protect their impunity, uh, and they shouldn't be, you know, in the in the courthouses. Uh, that's why they are, you know, when they fight for the elections, they fight for their lives. Actually, that's why they are so unstoppable. That's why they are so ruthless. That's that's why they are so limitless. Trump is not only Trump. Trump is part of a global web of money and power and so on. So even though these global uh, you know, neo-fascist leaders, let's say, uh, look like they hate each other sometimes, they talk about war, you know, make my country great again, you know, every, everybody has the greatest country on the planet, but they are actually uh, collaborating. They're co if not on economic and financial level, it is certainly on political level. And, you know, I, I already told in the book, you know, they are constantly paying respects to each other on, uh, <laughs> on media. So we should take this seriously. By the way, uh, How to Lose a Country is a good book to read, but actually it be really great to read Kleptopia by Tom Burgess, uh, How the Dirty Money Conquered the World. It's an amazing book. One should read it. I think they are sister books in, se on several way in several ways. So I, I would recommend that as well. We'll definitely look into it. Um, we've, we've seen that uh, populists are pretty terrible at handling pandemics um, in mm -hmm. March, you know, Duterte and um, Trump and Bolsonaro, all of them underplayed the, the, the significance of this moment. Um, what do you think is the link between sort of um, pandemic skepticism and, and right-wing populism? Um, well, I think they are not 
totally crazy. It's just that um, they want, they have to um, keep the economy going, and that is why they have to play this uh, stupid uh, to you know belittle the science, scientific uh, data, and so on. Um, and they have to be strong as well. They have, you know, not strong. They have to constantly show off power. And this is part of the game. You know, I am so men that the virus cannot touch me. Um, but on the other hand, we are dealing with these guys who do not have exact ideologies, proper ideologies, or they, they do not have ideological ideals. But what they want is ultimate power. And uh, I think if Corona or anything else benefits this power, it's a good thing. If not, it's not a good thing. That is the you know, very um, simple yet effective thinking of a dictator. And these are the guys we're dealing with. So they do not care about who dies unless their supporters begin dying. What do you think of, um, have you read the work by sort of Chantal Mouffe and uh, Ernesto Leclerc, which they actually promote populism as a strategy for the left? Uh, do you agree with them? Mm. Uh, the other day I was having a webinar in Mexico uh, for Mexican readers. And you know they are, uh, you know they have to deal with this guy Amlo, and it, it is interesting. Um, it, the middle class, upper middle class, and upper class is not happy with the guy, but also Subcomandante Marcos is not happy with him either. So <laughs> basically, a uh, Mexican leader is a liar, and he has this God syndrome, obviously, and he's using all the um, godlike. Uh, no, religious uh, theology and so on in order to uh, legitimize his ultimate power. Um, and he is so-called left-wing populist. I do not believe that he's a leftist or he doesn't have any progressive ideals because uh, it contradicts with the fact that it contradicts with, the, with his desire for ultimate power, definitely. Um, so left-wing populism, if you ask me, is an oxymoron. Because populism means mobilizing, you know, organizing and mobilizing ignorance towards a political goal. And that has nothing to do with being progressive, unfortunately. So I think left-wing populism, the phrase itself, is an oxymoron. And how do you think you balance um, nationalism and a love of country with this this sort of right wing um, xenophobic type of nationalism? Do you think there is a place for um, patriotism? Patriotism. Hmm. These are so like fine tuned words. I know, but I think it, it, it changes from country to country what, the, what those word, words refer to because every word has a history in every country and those are different histories. Those histories generally uh, you know, include some amount of blood, of course, and hatred and uh, jingoism and so on. But if we are not going to believe and preach internationalism now, when are we going to do it? When this, uh, you know, when the world is so connected as it is today, and when our problems are so um, same, and we, you know, we share the same problem of, you know, simply coming to the end of times. Um, when are we going to talk about internationalism? There is a uh, one of my favorite Turkish writers, Said Faik, and he's also translated to English. Um, has a beautiful sentence. He says, "Those who remember everything cannot belong to anywhere, 
they're not going to be loved. They're not going to love their country, but they're going to die loving everyone and everywhere. Um, and uh, that's a uh, that's a quotation that I put in um, in front uh, in the beginning of Time of Meets Once, my novel. Uh, and I do believe in that. You know, it makes you it, it it leaves you in a lonely place time to time, uh, belonging to somewhere or not belonging to somewhere in this case. But you die loving everyone and everything, everywhere, every country. So that's a choice, and we have to think about those words rather: internationalism and being international, supranational, in fact. This is what I think. I agree. Um, I was going to ask about um, the effects of uh, populism on, on the, the centre grounds. Do you think we've seen a, a rightward shift in recent years, like sort of national populism light? I couldn't get the question, I'm sorry. Um, I was yeah. going to ask about um, how uh, right-wing populism has uh, impacted the center ground. So, for example, in this country, we've seen uh, a, a normally moderate conservative government um, prorogue parliament. It's supposed to be a conservative government that stands for institutions and um, respects the history and so on. Um, do you think we've sh seen a shift to the right in recent years? Oh, yeah, definitely. Uh, and when it happened in Turkey, it was quite mm, confusing for me because all of a sudden I was radical left, but I didn't stand where I change, uh, where I didn't change where I stand. The, and I was telling everybody that the ground had shifted and now I am like uh, standing on this radical left. Um, the ground shifted certainly, uh, but it has been shifting since the end of 1970s. And that was the biggest, mis one of the biggest mistakes of tree. they, they, they deleted sort of erased the left from the political spectrum so the entire spectrum was now between centrists and right-wing uh, politics that's why we have extreme centrists um, today and they are trying to um, keep together the entire political mechanism in in several countries which they are not very successful at as we know um, so yeah, and it is ironic to me. Uh, the other day I was on, uh, for some reason, I was on the website of Davos, the economic, uh, economy guys, you know. Um, anyway, um, so I, I saw these uh, green ideas, um, you know, sustainable development ideas, micro, micro credit and so on. And I thought, oh my God, you know, all these leftist ideas, progressive ideas, let's say, um, they're now turning to it and now they are rebranding it. It's something, you know, I don't know, something more fancy, fancy and so on. But uh, I think uh, many more people now are realizing that the left shouldn't have been erased from the political spectrum. Bernie Sanders, uh, thanks to Bernie Sanders, many Americans know that socialism is not a uh, a monstrous, monstrous uh, creature, but uh, ideology where <laughs> the weak and the poor are um, protected as well. So, yeah, uh, the ground has shifted, but now I think there is a sort of counter shift, especially in the new generation, that's your generation, actually, because it is, it is interesting to watch this, to follow this change for me because I am the middle generation, so to speak. Uh, in, I, I watched it happening in 1980s and 90s, 1990s, how the capitalist human being was produced, manufactured. It happened before our eyes. And now the young people are, uh, and we were all under the, uh, influence, let's say, of the Cold War. Socialism was this, you know, horrible thing. And there was this, you know, a lot of propaganda about that. Communism, the, 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 the dirty communists, the, the terrifying communists and so on. Your generation, however, 
did not have to suffer that propaganda because the Cold War was over. Capitalism was in, in full force and they, they were completely uh, self-confident. Since they weren't influenced by the Cold War propaganda, anti-communist propaganda, uh, they were more open to the word socialism. That's why the word became one of the most popular looked up words in, in the web in the United States after Bernie Sanders uh, came along. So I think that shift to right is somehow, uh, you know, shifting back uh, to a little bit left. I wouldn't say left, but like, you know, towards, in, inclining towards left which is a good thing because we have to be there as well. I'll ask, uh, I'll ask one more and then we'll throw it over to everyone else. So if you want to start putting your questions in the chat, that would be great. Um, speaking of centrist, uh, centrism, we've got um, a centrist who's about to become president. Um, do you think there's a risk that uh, the United States will become complacent under Joe Biden? Complacent to what? To Trump. Oh, um, well, these are, um, you know, American, America is a very large country. It's a continent. Uh, so it's not easy to predict, uh, even for those who really know America well enough to analyze its entire politics. <clears throat> um, but what I find very important is that, uh, until, um, when Trump came to power, the women took to this and they made it very clear that they want this kind of misogyny, uh, you know, white supremacists in the White House. And we now have 70 million of people who voted for a man who robbing pussies in the White House. This is a split country. Uh, and uh, I'm coming from Turkey. I, I know what it means to be over politicized, uh, you know, over politicized and over polarized country. You know that we have two types of toilets in Turkey. It's one is Alla Turka, one is Alla Franga. Alla Franga is a normal toilet. Alla Turka is basically a, a hole on the ground. So even the toilets became a political matter in Turkey. Not building a La Turca toilets became a sign of not supporting the government, let's say. So when it, it can go that deep, that shit deep, uh, and the polarization can become um, the central matter of a country. And I'm afraid uh, this is what's going to rule America for, for a while. This polarization, not Biden, not Trump, but this polarization. So it's going to be really interesting, but not very mm, nice to follow, I think. And on that, what, what do you think of, um, you know, you read some op-eds who, who talk about like the the new civil war in america or america's on the on the brink of a new civil war what do you what do you think of those i find it so interesting that this civil war is so um, present in people's minds this is something i didn't really know about the united states you know american psyche that it was so present it's like it can happen again and it can happen tomorrow that urgency, that, mm, yeah, uh, that it, it, the, the feeling of being at war so imminent, I didn't know that it was there. So I think many people were, like me, who did not know the American psycho, were kind of surprised to hear this. As soon as there was a crisis, uh, you know, many people were talking about civil war. So the, obviously there is a war going on, although nobody's killing each other in massive numbers. Um, I don't think there'll be a clear cut war. This is, that's why I'm telling it's the confusion and it's the, um, it is the, you know, this mixed situation, the constant crisis. This is, these are the new tools of oppression. 
So I don't think there will be a clear cut war or anything. But, you know, who knows? It's the century of dramas already. So <laughs> I, I don't know how closely you've been following the UK, but um, it, unfortunately, it, tell me. <laughs> um, but how, how close? How, it, once, well, Brexit is, um, it's not formally concluded, but we've left the European Union. Um, do you think that the UK's got the, the potential to unite again, or do you think it's, this is just not going to solve anything? It is so interesting. The entire time Britain uh, lived this process, as if it's not happening, or as if it's not going to happen. And now it's happening, and they are still uh, doing the same thing. I like to believe that underestimation is the favorite sport of Britain. They are underestimating everything, <laughs> so, you know, hoping that it won't happen at the end. <laughs> um, one good thing, finally, those famous tradition, uh, you know, democratic tradition, or, you know, famous. Um, you know, centuries old institutions are finally a little bit reacting to what's happening, I guess. So, <clears throat> but then this is the age of disintegration, obviously. It's not only Britain is disintegrating from, you know, leaving European Union, but European Union itself is becoming a caricature as well. Uh, so, I don't know what will happen, but I am following um, how the institutions are responding to the fervent, uh, you know, political moves coming from the government. That is interesting to watch. And I think one of the things British uh, people did, one of the mistakes that British people did was to laugh at Boris Johnson, laugh at Brexit for too long. They yeah, should have I fully agree, history. yeah. But you know, when you're serious in Britain, especially in London, they, they call you passionate, and passionate is not a compliment in British English. So <laughs> I try to warn them, <laughs> what can I do? <laughs> and uh, do you think there's a general dissatisfaction with democracy as a as a method of governance? Do you think uh, people are um, losing faith in its ability to deal with crises such as climate change and pandemics even? Well, dissatisfaction uh, is there for a reason. <clears throat> and that's my main argument. I mean, like um, the, the fundamental contract of capitalism does not, uh, you know, um, comply with the contract of democracy, because when there is no social justice, there is no democracy. That's easy as that. So Britain, United States, and all other countries, as, especially after 2008 financial crisis, the gap between the poor and the rich is uh, exuberant. It is almost to, it, it reached the disgusting level of disgusting. So how can you have a democracy in a country where people are fighting for their dignity, to, to keep their dignity intact uh, when they are starving? So, uh, you know, when you don't feel like a human anymore, when you are not counted as a human, when you're not passed as a human in a system, I mean, you can have all the, you know, House of Commons, House of Lords, all the, you know, Supreme Courts, whatever, doesn't make a difference. Uh, when there is no social justice, democracy becomes only the theatrics of itself. Uh, we haven't had a question yet. It'd be great if we could get some from um, audience members. But um, I was going to ask... Which country do you fear for the most? Hmm. I didn't ever think of terms in terms of fear. Hmm. I think India. Because, you know, when we're talking about right-wing populists and so on, 
we hardly talk about India. Our focus is mostly on Western countries. And now, of course, because Trump is so, you know, uh, it's interesting, let's say, uh, we talk about United States or Europe. But India is uh, extremely important. I, I fear for, not fear, I wouldn't fear, but um, I am uh, trying to follow it. Uh, and I'm concerned, let's say, about India. But then let's talk about fear. Mm, that's uh, not a good word, I think. And we should drop that word. I'm writing a book and it's going to come out in May and one of the chapters is about fear. And, and I'm proposing to replace fear with attention, full attention. I think that is more that would be more productive and uh, that would benefit us more. Uh, how do you think we can achieve more attention? Attention is not attention seeking attention. It is more, you know, in deeper sense attention. Uh, if you really try to understand something, if you really pay attention, uh, the fear uh, becomes less important than it is today. And if you put your fear in the bigger scheme of the crisis, uh, among the other sufferings of the other people, you can see it in, true, in its true size. And fearful situations are not completely bad at all, because they also create solidarity, generosity, and kindness as well. So uh, fear is not a, complete, a thing that we completely have to reject. And especially in these times when crises come one after another, I think we should um, be more intimate with our fears and not be embarrassed by them. And at times embrace them and understand them because there will be a lot of fears due to political reasons, economic reasons, and because of the climate. And then we will have to deal with the you know, word fear more, I think, in, in months, in coming years. So we've got a question here. It's, um, they've said on the topic of democracy, what makes an electoral system more democratic? Is it possible to have an electoral system that is truly democratic? Um, of course. You know what I'm thinking? Um, all the, all the brightest brains, what are they doing today? What is the most, I'm like, I'm asking you, what is the most you know, fancy job of today's world? Um, probably a vaccine developer. No, um, it's today, today, but like, you know, for the last 10 years, what was it? Uh, code writing, I, I would say, right? No you know, uh, AI or virtual reality or, you know, that kind of high tech stuff. Those are the guys who really earn money, the guys who really rule the world in a sense. The pioneers of the time, blah, blah. What if those guys build up a system that, uh, facilitates direct democracy. I'm just throwing ideas now. It's not something that I thought of. Uh, what if those guys create an application uh, or applications, let's say, uh, what if those guys even create the internet for everyone, free for everyone? And they are trying to do such things as well. So it all depends on uh, this question especially, depends on where you invest the brightest brains of humankind today. If we invest there, of course. I mean, like, I think it would take them 15 days or so to arrange such a thing. But representative democracy uh, <clears throat> in its current form is crumbling, that's for sure. And we need a more participatory democracy. And also, we need to sort out one big problem, uh, the will to participate, it's not there anymore. 
people do not have faith in their own decision, in other people's decision, and so on. And that is a problem that we cannot solve with an application, obviously, or with, with, with high-tech people. That's a moral, that's a political problem. So we need to talk more and more. So we've got another question here. Um, so you've talked about how social media facilitates new and regulated expressions of fascism. Uh, Charlie was wondering if you think uh, it is possible to use social media to combat this neo-fascism. And have you got any thoughts on what is usually called slacktivism? Hmm. Um, slacktivism, I don't, uh, I, I don't know much about it, so I'm not going to talk about that. But uh, I have to remind you that before social media was used uh, for creating post-truth, or um, in the, before you know Twitter or Facebook was <clears throat> was at the, you know was used for the for the authoritarian leaders, they were actually used by people like us <clears throat> in Tahrir, sorry, in Tahrir, in all the other Occupy movements in Spain, in Turkey, in, during Gezi uprising. It was only after that these leaders realize the power of these gadgets, of these, you know, uh, tools. And then they started their own uh, troll uh, factories, uh, their own webs of, uh, you know, massive flies and so on. So uh, the social media has already been used against oppression and still being used. And it's a matter of power, who is more powerful. So if you're more organized and thus more powerful, we can always uh, make an impact with social media for sure. But we shouldn't forget that this is not an agora, Twitter, Facebook. It's not an agora where everybody is equal, where everybody has a free pass. This is someone's private garden, so to speak. It's a private property that we are shouting our politics, Twitter, social, any kind of social media. So we should never forget the limits of social media and not overestimate it, I think, because the limits is at the end of the day is drawn by profit and uh, you know, the company rules that owns those social media networks. So uh, I've asked you about Britain, but we've got another one here. Um, how close is Britain to fascism? <laughs> Not that close. <laughs> Not that close. And this is the thing, you know, fascism, this is what I'm trying to tell. Fascism is not, uh, it does not look like second world war movies anymore. They had a style. These guys do not. <laughs> they had, an, uh, jokes aside, they had an ideology, an ideal for the human being. And, you know, they were trying to shape the women and the men and the children. This is not like that. This is a mess. And in that sense, there is no country is tuned to what's happening in the world now, uh, politically and morally. And there is no country in the world that can protect itself <clears throat> completely from the contaminating effect of global rise of fascism. Um, so Britain is no, not closer than the other countries. And this is all I can say. I suppose I've got a question on um... Uh, literature, which is something you care about. Um, oh, and, um, Finally, some nice things to talk about. <laughs> you know, whenever a, a crisis occurs, we, 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 we turn to the sort of 1984 analogy, and then, you know, people start thinking of Sam Yatin and, um, you know, Brave New World and books like that, utopian, mm -hmm. um, dystopian uh, forms of literature. Uh, how useful are books like that, do you think, in conceptualizing how we understand the world today? 
well, you know, yeah, they suddenly they became bestsellers. They were like, they were almost forgotten because I remember reading Zamyatin, I was 16 and then I read Orwell years later. Mm. Um, and I think it's easy to attribute, to, you know, make it, uh, to clarify your mind about what's happening. But then these books are, of course, aesthetic uh, entities and they make things look clearer, not simpler, but clearer. And my, unfortunately, the things are not happening in that clear way in today's world. Mm, so, some level, it's good that people are becoming alert through these books to what's happening in the world today. But also, it is simplifying the matter. And they are waiting for those signs that they saw in those books. It doesn't, unfortunately, work like that. Yeah. Uh, I, I think I'll go for two more and then we'll, we'll call an end to it. Um, so you're a, you're a journalist, of course. Um, what, how, how, what's the, the situation in journalism like at the moment? Do you think it's um, in trouble? Uh, I wouldn't uh, call my journalist, journal, myself a journalist anymore because it has been, I don't know how many years, um, let's say since 2012, I, I'm not doing journalism. Uh, but I'm writing for newspapers, as you said in the beginning. Um, so, but journalism is a habit and also it's a personality dysfunction, dysfunctionality in, in the personality <laughs> I think as well. I don't think it's a job. It's a, it's not a profession. It is just a, you know, a habit. Uh, and once it's, in you, you cannot get rid of, it, rid of it. But professionally, I'm not doing journalism since a long time. Journalism in Turkey, hmm, it is not better than Britain, <laughs> I would say. Um, and I think journalism globally has uh, declined for economic reasons, for uh, because of the social media, internet, and so on. But true, people are, this is what's interesting in today's journalism, people are constantly looking for a certain genuineness. And that genuine stuff is no longer, uh, they feel like this, it is no longer in the newspapers or in televisions. So they, con they lost their trust in the logos, let's say, New York Times, or it is damaged, let's say, that trust, that deep trust is damaged. And they instead look for those guys on the ground, you know, that do, they do not know, who are, who, who are writing things on Twitter real time. So this is a big shift and in, in our understanding of journalism, in our understanding of telling the truth. So I think this is going to be the problem, even if we solve the financial problem, the institutional problem, or the web problem of journalism. This is going to be the long lasting problem of journalism. They are not, they are no longer seen as the guardians of truth, I think. Okay, I'll, I'll finish with this. So, um, Great. 2010 to 2020 was a pretty torrent decade and a great deal happened. Um, are you optimistic that 2020 to 2030 is going to be a, a better decade? Are you optimistic for the future? Um, <clears throat> I'm not thinking in terms of optimism or pessimism. And I do not like the word hope because it's too fragile for our times, I think. But I am, I, I believe in you and people like you. And I'm serious when I say this, I mean it. I believe in ourselves and I believe in people like you and uh, the other participants here. Um, 
And this is what I can see, say about, not only about 2020, but also for the coming years as well. We'll get used to it and uh, the, the, this, you know, constant uh, abnormality, constant crisis thing, and we're going to make it better. It's going to happen because whatever happened uh, throughout the human history, nobody could stole, steal from us our determination to create beauty. So we're going to do it again. Easy as that. Well, that's very nice to hear. Um, thanks very much for joining us. It's, uh, it's been a real right. pleasure to talk it's to you. It's a pleasure. Um, and yeah. keep an eye out for um, our events coming up this term. We've, of course, got Noam Chomsky uh, at the end of term. And um, we've uh, got another couple in the works, hopefully. Um, but Eche, thanks for your time. Uh, it was great to talk to you. Thank you, Ryan. Thank All you. Right. Take care. Thanks, Bye. thanks everyone. Bye-bye.